because of the structure of alcohol, it is what's called both water soluble and fat soluble. Translated into what's meaningful for you, what that means is when you drink alcohol, it can pass into all the cells and tissues of your body. It has no trouble just passing right into those cells. So unlike a lot of substances and drugs that actually attach to the surface of cells, to receptors as they're called, little parking spots, and then trigger a bunch of domino cascades of effects, alcohol actually has its own direct effects on cells because it can really just pass into those cells. So it's water and fat soluble. And the fact that it can pass into so many organs and cells so easily is really what explains its damaging effects, okay? It produces substantial stress and damage to cells. I'd love to be able to tell you otherwise, but that's just a fact. Ethanol produces substantial damage to cells. And it does that because when you ingest ethanol, it has to be converted into something else because it is toxic to the body. And there's a molecule inside of all of us called NAD. NAD and related biochemical pathways are involved in converting that ethanol into something called acetylaldehyde. It's broken down into acetylaldehyde. And if you thought ethanol was bad, acetylaldehyde is particularly bad. Acetylaldehyde is poison. It will kill cells. It damages and kills cells and it is indiscriminate as to which cells it damages and kills. Now, that's a problem, obviously. And the body deals with that problem by using another component of the NAD biochemical pathway to convert acetylaldehyde into something called acetate. Acetate is actually something that your body can use as fuel. And that process of going from ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate does involve the production of a toxic molecule. And the place where it does that is within the liver. And cells within the liver are very good at this conversion process, but they are cells and they are exposed to the acetylaldehyde in the conversion process. And so cells within the liver really take a beating in the alcohol metabolism events. So when you ingest alcohol, you are, yes, ingesting a poison and that poison is converted into an even worse poison in your body. And some percentage of that worse poison is converted into a form of calories that you can use to generate energy, generate ATP. Now, the important thing to understand is that it is the poison, the acetylaldehyde itself, that leads to the effect of being inebriated or drunk. I think most people don't realize that, that being drunk is actually a poison-induced disruption in the way that your neural circuits work. It's consumed into the gut, right? Goes into the stomach. The liver immediately starts this conversion that we talked about before of ethanol to acetylaldehyde to acetate. And some amount of acetylaldehyde and acetate are making it into the brain. It crosses the blood-brain barrier. Again, the brain has this fence around it that we call the blood-brain barrier or the BBB. Many things, most things, thankfully, can't pass across the blood-brain barrier, but alcohol, because it's water and fat soluble, just cruises right across this fence and into the milieu, the environment of the brain, which is made up of a couple different major cell types, neurons, nerve cells, and so-called glial cells, which are in between the nerve cells. So one of the first things that happens, there's a slight suppression in the activity of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. This is an area of your neocortex that's involved in thinking and planning and perhaps above all in suppression of impulsive behavior. So if you go to a party and they're serving alcohol and people are consuming drinks, what you'll notice is that a few minutes into that party, the volume of people's voices will increase. And that's because people are simply not paying attention to their voice modulation. And as other people start speaking more loudly, other people are speaking more loudly. We've all had this experience, right? Of going to a party and then you step outside for a moment and you go, oh my goodness, I was shouting. You come home the next day, you got a sore throat. It might be that you picked up some sort of bug, some virus or something. But oftentimes it's just the fact that you've been shouting all night just to be heard because as the prefrontal cortex shuts down, people stop modulating their, their level of speech quite as much. Also notice that people start gesticulating more. People will start standing up and sitting down more. They'll start walking around more. If there's music on, people might spontaneously start dancing. All of this is because these areas of the prefrontal cortex normally are providing what's called top-down inhibition. They are releasing a neurotransmitter called GABA onto various parts of the brain. They're involved in impulsive motor behavior and thought patterns. And as you shut down the prefrontal cortex, that GABAergic suppression of impulses starts to be released. So people will say things that they want to say without so much forethought about what they're saying. Or they might do things that they want to do without really thinking it through quite as much, or they might not even remember 
thinking it through at all or experience, I should say, thinking it through at all. We haven't talked about blacking out yet in the effects of alcohol on memory. But as long as we're there, I'll just tell you that alcohol has a very strong effect in suppressing the neural networks that are involved in memory formation and storage. This is why oftentimes we forget the events of a night out if we've been drinking. Also, that areas of the brain that are involved in flexible behavior, sort of considering different options, like I could do A or I could do B. I could say this to them or I could say that. I could say it in that way or I could say it in this way. This might be a little more tactful. Those brain areas basically shut down entirely and people just tend to say what they want to say. So the key thing to understand is that when people drink, the prefrontal cortex and top-down inhibition is diminished. That is habitual behavior and impulsive behavior starts to increase. Now, what's interesting is this is true in the short term. So after people have one or two, maybe three or four drinks, but it's also true that the more often that people drink, there are changes in the very circuits that underlie habitual and impulsive behavior.